get into it. This is the word of God, Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 to 11, about Jonah's reaction to God when he extended mercy towards the Ninevites. This is the word of God. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, it is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city of Nineveh. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm and that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do. Well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Thus says the Lord, 15 minutes starting now. All right, at what point is our anger no longer righteous, but rather disobedient to God? Four red flags that I want to point out from the passage. Point one, when it makes us forgetful of God's grace. Two, when it makes us resentful of God's world. Three, when it makes us feel victimized by God's discipline. And four, when it makes us dismissive of God's heart. Okay, those four points. You can write it down and take a picture of it, but I gotta move on. Point one, our anger has crossed over from the realm of good and rightness to sin and harm. One, when we forget God's grace. Jonah forgot God's grace. Look at verse one. So God, in chapter 3, extended mercy to the other side, right? Extended mercy to the Ninevites, Jonah's enemies. And Jonah, it says, was angry. Verse 1 and 2, it it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew. I knew you were going to do this. I knew you were nice. I knew you were kind. I knew you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Jonah was upset that God was a gracious, merciful, and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, kind of God, to the Ninevites. Now, as I, as I read the end of verse 2 just now, did that sentence ring a bell to you? And I hope it did, because we read it for our call to worship. And I've purposely repeated it a few times so that you guys would get that. Our call to worship, we read that God is a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And if you remember the context of when God said this, it was in Exodus. And why did God say this? Because the Israelites just sinned. Jonah's people just sinned. And Jonah's people worshipped a false god named Baal. And that's why God said, look, I should punish the Israelites, but I'm not gonna. Why? Because I'm a God who's gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. That's the context, right? Jonah's repeating that very sentence God said to God. He's saying, I don't like you being that witted in Ninevites. You see the hypocrisy here? (laughs) See what's going on? Jonah, an Israelite who benefited from God's grace, mercy, patience, and steadfast love in Exodus, was upset when the same grace, mercy, patience, and steadfast love was applied to his enemies. You see the hypocrisy? It was so easy for him to apply this mercy to him and his own tribe But when God calls him to do it to the other tribe, all of a sudden, it's a form of injustice. All of a sudden, it's not right. That's our first red flag, friends, of when our anger has crossed over from being righteous and helpful to being disobedient and harmful. It's when it gives us short-term memory of God's grace and produces hypocrisy in our lives. 
every single person in both camps, Israel and Nineveh, are utterly dependent upon God's mercy. That's the first red flag, short-term memory of God's grace. Second red flag is when it causes resentment in our hearts toward God's world. Let's move on to verse 4. Jonah was, was livid. He was so angry. And he said, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah wanted to die. Why? Because he didn't want to live in a world where the reality of that world is governed by a God whose mercy triumphs over wrath. He doesn't want to live in a reality where mercy triumphs over wrath. That's not the kind of world he wanted to be a part of. Why not? Because that kind of world requires too much endurance from his end. Jonah's anger was so intense towards the Ninevites, and sometimes our anger can be so intense toward other people or toward that one person that might come to our minds right now as I preach this. And it would take too much emotional toil for Jonah to self-regulate and get with God's program of mercy. He'd rather be done with it. He'd rather leave it. And we've we've been there, haven't we, friends? I I definitely know that I have. I've gotten to heights of rage. (laughs) That if anyone were to remind me of God's call for mercy at that point, all that's going to want to make me do is roll my eyes and leave the room immediately. And I... I don't think I'm the only one who's gotten there. That's the headspace Jonah was in in verse 4. But for Jonah, the person he was escaping from couldn't be avoided just by leaving a room. So what did he have to do? He wanted to die. He wanted to leave this world as if there's a space in the afterlife in which this gracious God is not also king of. Now let me just clarify the point here. God isn't rebuking Jonah for being angry to the Ninevites. The Ninevites did tons of bad things to Israel. It's understandable he was angry. God is rebuking Jonah's desire to escape God's call toward mercy. And and we all can relate to that. It takes an unbelievable amount of energy for angry sinners like us to remain in a world where we're commanded to let mercy triumph over wrath. It's exhausting to do that. And you've tried it. It's not like you can just drown out your anger with willpower. (laughs) You've tried that, right? Just don't be angry, don't be angry. What happens? You get angrier. All the intensity of that willpower translates to more anger. So we're left here feeling helpless and resentful to God that he would even ask us to try. Because I can't do it. We can't do it. So we just want to be done with it. We want to roll our eyes and leave the room. And that's our second red flag, friends, of when our anger has crossed over from rightness and goodness to disobedience and harm is if it's caused us to be resentful of the reality that mercy should triumph over wrath. That's the kind of God that rules this world. And I know it's hard to do so, but once we roll our eyes and walk out of the room, when God calls us toward mercy, that's a red flag. Third red flag, Jonah felt victimized by God's discipline. So God heard Jonah's request to die, right? I want to die. But God didn't give in to Jonah's self-sabotaging request. What did God do? He remained patient, and he remained committed to Jonah, and he proceeded to teach him a lesson, a lesson about graciousness. How? By covering him from the sun with a plant. Look at verse 5. Jonah went to this hilltop right in the east of the city where he can kind of get a clear view of Nineveh down below. And he sat there under the scorching heat of the desert sun. He didn't care. By the way, back then, desert suns would kill you, okay? Heat strokes. Like this isn't just, he's just sitting there. He's risking his life in hope that Nineveh would still burn. He was that angry at them. I would sit here and die if I can just see the other side burn, And it says that while Jonah was doing this, God covered him from the sun with a plant. You see how gracious God is with Jonah. But then verse 7 says, God took the plant away to teach him a lesson, which we'll talk about later. And Jonah was angry. So for for now, we'll talk about what this plant lesson is later. For now, I just want to make sure we have the right narrative here. Here's the narrative. Here's the story. 
Jonah is being taught a lesson by God. That is the correct storyline. Jonah was in God's classroom, but Jonah's anger made him curate his own version of the story. Look at what Jonah said in verse 8, okay? After God took the plan away, Jonah said, it is better for me to die than to live. That's a loaded phrase, and unless you're you're familiar with the Old Testament, you won't really understand what Jonah's saying there. This phrase, it is better for me to die than to live, that was a famous phrase that's often used by prophets in the Old Testament who were unjustly treated. So, for example, Elijah said this phrase when the people of Israel were unjustly persecuting him. Jeremiah used this phrase when he was unjustly beat up by another priest, by the way. (laughs) Moses used this phrase when the Israelites justly blamed him for all their problems in the desert. It's all his fault. They all said this phrase. And now Jonah's using this phrase to describe himself. What does that tell us about Jonah? It tells us that he viewed himself as a victimized prophet, like Moses and Elijah and Jeremiah. But is that true? Is that the storyline? Is Jonah a victimized prophet treated unjustly by God, like Moses, Elijah, and Jeremiah was by other people? No. He wasn't a victim here. He was a disobedient prophet. You see that? Jonah's anger, what it did, is it made him make up his own storyline about what's going on. It made him curate his own narrative. It made him view God's classroom as an unjust courtroom. His anger made him view God's surgical knife meant for heart surgery as an abusive sword meant for harm. A red flag that tells you when your anger has crossed over from being right and good to being sinful and harmful is when you start to believe that all this pain, all this need for self-regulation, all this call toward mercy was meant by God to harm you and not to help you. Intense anger makes us change the storyline that supports what we want. And it can make God's surgical knife to look like an abusive sword. That's the fourth red flag, third red flag. Okay, all right, last red flag. Jonah was dismissive of God's heart. Look at verse nine. God asked Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? Which is more like, do you think you have the right to be angry for the plant? Um, And Jonah said, yes, I do. Angry enough to die. Now here's a point of this plant lesson. Look at verse 10. Verse 10, the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? You should have seen here a glimpse into God's heart. God is telling Jonah, look, my relationship with the people of Nineveh is much longer with your relationship with this plant that was like, 12 hours. I saw them get born. I saw them take their first steps. I saw them grow up, fall in love, make mistakes, go through heartbreak, struggle to find a job, go through the ups and downs of marriage, have children, leave them behind to go to war, Surviving the war and being so thankful they get to hold their kid one last time before the next one, baby. (laughs) I've been with them for a long time. And Jonah, you're so easily saying, just crush them. Crush them all. All 120,000 of them. Children, babies, crush them all. Kill the whole lot. You know what Jonah's problem was? He saw these people as two-dimensional caricatures. People on the other side are one giant brushstroke, bad, ignorant, evil. The whole tribe, I just, done, verdict's out. And look at God's response in verse 11. God doesn't disagree. He did say, you're right. In in chapter 3, God told the Ninevites to repent. God's saying, look, I agree, there's a lot of evil there, there's a lot of ignorance and sin and, and wrong there. But also, they don't know their right hand from their left. What does God mean by that? It means that their life story, which God's been a part of all these years, 
God knows how it's shaped them to be the kind of people they are today. And their culture has been a culture of war. That's all their community and echo chambers have filled their heads with. They don't know their left hand from their right. God isn't excusing their current sin because of their past. No, God calls them to repent in chapter 3. There is sin there. There is evil there. God agrees with Jonah on that point. But the difference is, Jonah viewed these people as two-dimensional characters. But God sees their whole story and knows their whole persons. Empathy is produced through knowing. By the way, why do you think God mentioned cattle at the end? God wasn't equating the people of Nineveh with cattle, no. He's saying there's a cluelessness that plagues these people. That's cattle-like. You want me to just one brush throw, kill them all? If you were born in Nineveh, Jonah, you'd be just like them. The fact that you and your tribe is closer in proximity to the truth wasn't due to your own wisdom. It's because I placed you where I placed you. Another sign that our anger has left the realm of rightness and goodness and entered into the realm of disobedience and harm is if it's caused us to view people on the other camp as two-dimensional. And if it's caused us to accredit our closer proximity to the truth as a result of our own self-effort. That is pride and arrogance. Okay. I'll get to the good news of the cross at the benediction because I'm out of time, 15 minutes. But let me just summarize right now, friends, and ask all of us here, how many of Jonah's red flags are currently present in your heart? Has your anger toward that person or that camp caused you to hypocritically have short-term memory of God's grace? Has it caused you to roll your eyes toward God's call for mercy? Has it made you feel victimized by God's discipline? And has it made you view that person as a two-dimensional character to delete? If so, then join the club. (laughs) I feel a lot of them too in my own heart, all the time. But friends, there is hope. There is hope for wrath-ridden people like us. Hope that we'll talk about after our last closing song. Pray with me as I close our sermon for today. Father, we come to you, and I pray that as we navigate through this confusing time of differences of opinion about how to move forward, and all the implications that COVID has towards schools and churches and institutions and jobs. And as we go through um, handling this with loved ones and with people that we don't know, as we type to comment something online, help us, Father, analyze our hearts and see whether or not our anger has transferred over from the realm of good and rightness to the realm of sin and harm. Help us, Father, to view your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray.